You're tuned into Holy Smokes, cigars, Catholicism, and conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode number 42. Uh, now, before I introduce my very esteemed and special guest this evening, I just want to let everybody know that Havana Palace on Huron Church Road in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, is the official sponsor of the Holy Smokes podcast. Uh, Family-owned and operated cigar shop fine selection, best prices, um, and just the service is phenomenal. They take great care of myself, my family, and my friends. So if you guys would be so kind as to just go to facebook.com slash Havana Palace and give them a like uh, and browse their page if you feel so inclined, I uh, would greatly appreciate it, and they would as well. So I have with me um, Dr. David Eastman tonight. Now, um, how this actually came about was a mutual friend, Dr. Jim Papandrea, who I, whom I've had on the show already twice and plan to do so again in the very near future, actually um, introduced us and, and got this connection going. And I'm very excited because Dr. Eastman has a new book on the way uh, due out later this year on North African Christianity. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So before I hand the floor over to David, I'm just going to read uh, his biography. Dr. Eastman is Cheryl Chair of Bible at the Macaulay School and a research fellow at the University of Resenberg in Germany. He is formerly Associate Professor and Chair of Religion at Ohio Wesleyan University. His research focuses on early Christianity, particularly traditions of martyrdom, the veneration of the saints, and biblical interpretation. He is the author of four books, Paul the Martyr, The Call to the Apostle in the Latin West in 2011, The Ancient Martyrdom Accounts of the Martyrdoms of Peter and Paul, 2015, the Many Deaths of Peter and Paul, 2019, and due out later this year, Early North African Christianity, Turning Points in the Development of the Church. He has lectured across the U.S. and in Europe and in Africa, and is passionate about helping Christians understand their collective past. He is co-editor of a book series published by Pennsylvania State University Press, a contributor to the Society of Biblical Literature's Bible Odyssey website, which is bibleodyssey.org, and is chair of the Society of Biblical Literature's Educational Resources and Review Committee, which brings resources for teaching the Bible to secondary schools and the broader public. So, Dr. Eastman, David, uh, welcome, my brother. How are you doing this evening? I'm well. And so, Dustin, I have something exciting to kind of tell you that uh, arriving today in my mail, I'll put it up here. Nice. Here's a copy of the book. So, it's now, I guess they're now beginning to ship. Wonderful. So um, here's a copy, and you'd rather see the copy of than me. But um, so the first copies are now out. So I'm excited about that. It's uh, it's good to see this in kind of in print. So. Absolutely, hold it in your hands. Well, congratulations on uh, the re release of that project. Um, very uh, excited for you, and I'm excited to get my own copy. And I have to thank you and uh, Lydia as well at Baker Academic for the lovely gift. So I can't wait to to unwrap that and dig in. So thank you. Um, all right. So before we talk about uh, the topic at hand tonight, for viewers who may not be familiar with you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, how did you grow up? What was your faith life like? What were some of your influences? Um, how did how did God grab a hold of your life? And how did he how did he sort of put you in the vocation of academia? And how do you use that to sort of uh, grow in your faith and help evangelize from where you're planted? So um, I grew up um, the son of a pastor, and so this is so a full full disclosure. I didn't grow up Roman Catholic. Um, I grew up Protestant, and um, I grew up the son of a pastor, and uh, which was not an easy experience in many cases. So um, I think that my parents, looking back, I now realize were um, the kind of people who who did things quietly to care for people who maybe were otherwise marginalized by society. Right. And, and I think I grew up now realizing we were surrounded by a lot of very, very judgmental people. Right. And so growing up, that's kind of what I thought Christianity was. Hmm. And um, really it was probably my late teens when I began to realize that I don't think this is really the, the person that I want to be. Mm -hmm. and so I had a period where I went, where I left the church and probably going through college into early graduate school. I was, I don't think I was ever an atheist, but I think I was agnostic. Agnostic, yeah. Um, and 
I ended up moving to France, which is, uh, I would, I love France, but it's probably one of the most godless countries on earth. Right. And, and there met a missionary who, uh, whose influence helped kind of steer me back in the right direction. And I, I think I realized I come to the end of myself and the paths that I was trying to, to forge for myself were leading me nowhere. And so I turned back and I said, God, if you're out there, I don't want to live the way I'm living. And overnight, literally overnight, um, my life was changed. So, um, and, and living in France was also formative for me because in a country like France, where there are so few Christians, relatively speaking, right. you, you form alliances with Christians as opposed to doing what a lot of what I saw growing up, looking for reasons to separate from other Christians. Uh -huh. looking for reasons to draw the, that that's not the mentality there. And that, that definitely was helpful for me in terms of seeing a Christianity um, with a different perspective and from a different viewpoint. So recognizing there are differences between different branches of Christianity, even within Protestantism, within Catholicism, there are differences, but, um, but I just heard, grew up hearing a lot of people trying to figure out what the differences were so they could therefore condemn this group or that group or whatever it happened to be. Right. So, um, but certainly growing up, there was a strong emphasis on the early church and, and a kind of an idealization of the early church. If we could just go back to the way the early church was, everything would be fine. So I think I had that interest from a young age. I now know from studying the early church that actually they didn't have everything figured out. And actually, when you start reading Paul's letters, it becomes immediately obvious they didn't have everything figured out. But um, that interest was probably there from my youth. And as I went into further studies, my interest in languages and ancient cultures and religion kind of came together into the study of early Christianity. And that's where I've, I've been for the better part of my adult life. Um, I, find it, I find it challenging and I find it helpful the same time and i'm also increasingly aware that that many christians even who desire to know the past the christian past yeah won't have access to that information easily right and that's part of what i'm trying to accomplish with the book is is open another chapter in the history of christianity and make it easily accessible to people who are who want to follow along who want to learn more about the past and see how that can help us understand our present so those are really a lot of things that that drive me well that's uh that's very noble um, yeah, if, if we don't understand our past, we're not going to understand our present and, you know, where we're our trajectory towards the future. So um, and, that, and that's key, you know, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, um, finding out about, you know, the faith of our of our fathers and mothers mm -hmm. um, and how they how they did things, the challenges that they face. And I, I think I don't want to say most of all, because all of that's important, but because <clears throat> I, I noticed that you have a, a heavy focus on martyrdom. Mm -hmm. You know, just just the courage that they had to mm -hmm. to witness to Christ in the culture that they lived, uh, you know, without regard for, uh, you know, penalty or even even their own lives. And they, they readily shed their their blood for our Lord and his gospel. So uh, it's definitely something that we need to reclaim mm -hmm. uh, in today's day and age. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and one of my concerns about that, this is one of my soapboxes, is a concern about calling things persecution, maybe that are that I would describe as inconveniences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's something that I that I think is potentially dangerous. It's kind of the boy crying wolf, where if every inconvenience we we experience as Christians, we label persecution, then when when what I would consider real persecution comes, and it could. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to be listening because there are, there is there compared to what the early church went through some of the things that that we may experience in our cultural context and and I live in in the south here in the US and a lot of things that people have been used to doing publicly as Christians that maybe are being curtailed in some ways uh, they've they've led to cries of persecution I'm thinking well that's an inconvenience but it's right. not persecution and there are many places in the world that people are dying for their faith and they're suffering for their faith in that way. So I think it, it, it's important to, to parse that out and see what that, what that legacy is and mm -hmm. understand it appropriately and apply it appropriately right. to our own context. And that can be challenging. Indeed. Yeah. Because 
like you said, you know, I, I mean, I hate to use COVID, but I mean, it's the most obvious example, right? Mm -hmm. um, the closure of, of churches to, you know, or to, to a limitation of capacity or, um, oh. you know, masks or, or what, what have you. Um, this is not persecution. We don't, we don't live in a communist state. Uh, it, I mean, and even if you want to get a good idea of the type of persecution that the early church endured, all you have to do is go to contemporarily uh, places in the Middle East and Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not something in the distant past for them. It's something that is very, very real yes. and relevant, right? So that helps put things into perspective. Yes. Um, when I am um, part of the writing of this book were some lectures I gave in Cairo for a class. And the second year that I was there, I had a chance to meet with the dean of a seminary there, of a Christian seminary in Cairo. And they, every summer they send students out to do summer internships. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that was a particularly um, volatile year in Egypt when the president who was elected and was president for nearly a year was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. And it was not a good year for Christians in Egypt. And so the dean said that when the students came back in the fall, they had a meeting to talk with them about their internships. And several of the students said, none of our classes told us what to do if a mob comes to your village and burns your church down. Wow. And they had stories of, of people, Christians being attacked, being killed, dragged behind mm. automobiles and all this filmed and put on the Internet. I mean, those kinds of things. And this is just a few years ago. Um, in Egypt, so there, there's it's very alive. And then the following year, the 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 beheading of 21 Christians in in Libya, 20 of whom were Orthodox, and uh, 21st proves from I think from Ghana, I believe, was the, and these things are alive and well in other parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge uh, Jim Papandrea. He's in the chat. He says, "Hey, fellas," <laughs> and my brother Elamine says peace bro these two uh, true four motivations this is trucking company so uh two loyal uh friends and viewers uh right now hopefully there will be more guys if uh, you feel so inclined you could always share this on your pages as the stream is going and if anyone wants to chime in or check in they certainly can uh well thank you for uh dr eastman uh sorry if i'm being too formal david Sorry, no, David. Uh, I, I prefer David, that, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, David. Well, thank you for, uh, for that introduction and uh, those initial reflections. Um, very, very good stuff. Uh, something that, you know, we, we, we all need to sort of put in our frame of reference and, and reflect on these days and times for sure. Uh, very uh, uh, helpful reference point. All right. So in terms of, um, before we get into your book, uh, just as a kind of prelude or segue, I noticed with interest, um, being Catholic myself, I am a convert from uh, Islam and Protestantism. So I was curious at uh, your interest in the cult of the saints. Mm -hmm. um, how did you how did you kind of get into that? Like what what mm -hmm. uh, what sparked that interest? Mm hmm. So when I was in graduate school, in one of our doctoral seminars, we had an assignment, uh, and I decided to work on Paul. Okay. And, and the idea was to look at the early reception of Paul's ideas. How did people read his ideas? How did they think about them? How did they interpret them? Mm. And as I began to work on that, what became clear to me was something that I never thought about before, that there's, there's the Paul of the letters in the New Testament. And as best we can, we tr can try to reconstruct his life and his travels and his challenges. But then there is the Paul that people looked back on and the Paul that they the Paul they imagined him to be. And, and that Paul can be very different. And so it's really it kind of came out of that interest in how did Christians in later centuries look back on Paul and think about Paul? And as I started being into that more, I realized that one of the, the dominant themes in in, liter in literature and in art and in liturgy was looking at Paul as a martyr. Mm. And so that began, I began to think, oh, what does that mean? So I kind of dug into that and that got me into this, this whole concept of, of the way that Paul's death yeah. influenced the interpretation of his life 
And in his own life, you read his letters, you can see even in his own life, people are, are opposing him and giving him a hard time and calling him a false apostle. And all, he, had, he did not have an easy life. And I tell my students all the time, if you imagine Paul as someone sitting in an ivory tower somewhere, yeah, yeah. dispensing truth, that is not the way it was. It was very down and dirty. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But in later centuries, the fact that he died as a martyr was proof of the depth of his faith. Mm -hmm. And because of that, then that that increases in his influence in subsequent centuries. Then I began looking around and realizing that that's true of others as well, of other right. figures. Because of the way they died, Christians remembered them in certain ways. And that got me started down. Then I began looking at the way that different cities would compete to be the primary city associated with a particular martyr and the way that they would use that as kind of as capital competing with each other for authority. And so this, there's, it began to unpack a lot of things to me. And I have a background in archaeology and a, an interest in actual material uh, objects. Mm -hmm. The relics really interested me as well. Oh, the sure. Relics work in that and how do they how do they fit into the story and um, the experience of going to an early Christian liturgy and the smells and the sights yeah. and the sounds. And, and it, it was not just kind of reading a book and sitting back and thinking about it. It was a full sensory experience yes. of Christian formation for people who didn't have a Bible to go home to. Right. And they couldn't get up and, and read. Well, I'm going to read Romans today. No, you didn't have Romans. That's right. What you had right. was interacting with these traditions and these stories and the, and these, uh, practices mm -hmm. through the cult right. of the saints, among other things. Right. And, uh, you know, and people often wondered why uh, early Christians weren't iconoclastic. Well, you know, you have to, you have to think like statuary and iconography. Mm -hmm. Again, people, not everybody could read number one and not, two, not everybody had access to the primary documents. So these were a way to sort of educate, uh, educate the late, the lady. Yes. Uh, this is the gospel, mm -hmm. you know, and like you said, interacting with the the devotions, uh, the cult of the saints, relics, the liturgy, all this was a way of imbibing the faith when you didn't, because it wasn't a primary textual culture like ours is today. And I think people right. people forget that. Yes, you know? yeah. I tell my students, I, I always when I, when I'm in fact this just this week and this next week I'll be talking about the formation of the New Testament and the class that I'm teaching now, and I'll ask one of them to get out a book. I could pull out my book, which is I think it's. 20, the paperback is 25 US dollars or something like that. Mm. I tell them, get out a book and it's relatively inexpensive. Right. But in the ancient world, that book would cost what a new car costs. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it had to be literally hand copied. Manuscript literally means written by hand. Yeah. So someone had to be paid to write it out word for word, copy it word for word. So many people couldn't read, not because they were dumb. Right. They didn't have any books to read. It, it wasn't a skill that they needed. Um, they had other skills. They used their memories much better than we do. Oh, absolutely. They called things better because if you forgot it, it was gone. You couldn't ask Siri. There was no Siri. <laughs> right. It was gone. So it, it was not, you're absolutely right. You, you can't just go back and look it up. You really have to hold on to these things. And, and even, but even today we know even as textual as education can be, mm -hmm. educational theory still tells us if you can have people move, you can have people touch and experience and taste things, there's a much deeper and more profound and more long lasting educational effect than just read this and move on. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. You know, and, and that's <clears throat> one of the things I find too, is, you know, some Christians kind of balk at the idea of sacred tradition and they use Jesus's words or his polemics against the Pharisees as mm -hmm. sort of a blanket or catch all against tradition and Toto. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they fail to make the distinction between holy tradition and apostolic tradition on the one hand and the misuse, the particular specific misuse or abuse of tradition by the Pharisees mm -hmm. on the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, if we throw out tradition, what what really what did the early church have mm -hmm. before we before we even really had a fixed canon? Like, yeah. how would how would we have lived our faith? But mm -hmm. but yet, not only did they live their faith, they were they were luminaries, uh, intellectually, morally, so they got along just fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, I I tell students frequently, and especially some of my Protestant students, I say we talk about sola scriptura in the time of the Reformation. 
mm. but but no one sits down and just reads Paul. Mm. The person who sits down to read Paul, you're not. I am not just reading Paul. I am reading. Pick modern author here. I am pick um, in the Protestant tradition. Someone like Tim Keller out of New York City is. Where I'm reading Tim Keller. Reading this person. Reading Martin Luther. Reading Augustine. Reading Paul. There are multiple lenses that stand between me and Paul. So I'm always come at, coming at it with tradition. Right? Tradition is part of it. That the biblical interpretation, biblical reception is part of it. Absolutely. And the idea that we come to scripture with with no lenses and no biases and and no, it's it's simply not realistic. And so we are all part of tradition. Um, yes. And it even it, so it's it's not a. I, I agree with you. The thing with the, the Pharisees is is the misuse. Mm. It's not that the problem was not that they were following the law. They were supposed right. to be following the law. Right. Right. They were supposed to be following the law, <laughs> but they had a misunderstanding of maybe what that meant. Yes. At least some of the Pharisees did, right? Other some, Pharisees, yeah. you know, similarly secretly followed Jesus. Right. But, but that's a distinction that's uh, hard to make. And it's very easy just to say, well, the Pharisees did this. Yeah. And it well, wasn't all of them. Yeah. Not all of them. And let's think, what were they actually doing? And, and what exactly was the problem there? Because it's not very difficult to find comparisons between what the Pharisees were doing and what a lot of maybe modern Christians are doing. And it's uh, it's a slippery slope, right? We want to be holy. We want to follow yeah. God's rules. We want to be ethical. Right. But we have to be careful of getting to the point that we believe we are so ethical and so holy mm. that we are then in a position to begin looking around and figuring out, you know, who's not. And, and I always say people like, that is not, that's not my job. I'll try to tell you what I think the Bible says, but the judgment part, that is God's job, not mine. Amen. Yeah, um, yeah the, uh, the publican and the Pharisee, right? One, uh, one of the greatest prayers that we can recall to memory is, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Right? That'll, that'll center us real quick. Yes. Um, uh, well, you know what, uh, David, I got to say, uh, I'm just really enjoying this conversation, even though we kind of haven't gotten into the meat and potatoes of it. I, I, I still, I still really, really am enjoying myself, and I feel like this is a divine appointment, and the Holy Spirit is uh, gracing our time together. And I pray that you know uh, our viewers out there can definitely uh, benefit. Uh, so please, if you guys are enjoying this, like, share, and subscribe. I would uh, greatly appreciate that. And I keep forgetting to tell uh, to tell people. I said once I hit 500 subscribers, which I did like last week or something, I was going to give away a book, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to um, make a little video explaining the stipulations. It's going to be just a short little thing, and I'm actually giving away uh, Dr. Jim Papandrea's book, "Handed Down: uh, The Catholic Faith of the Early Christians." So, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Um, so with that uh, little digression, I apologize. Okay. Uh, well, little... by the time this podcast is over, Jim will have written another book. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put that. it past them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got Christopher Roberts in. He says, good evening, Reverend Brian Lynch. Hello, Teresa. Hello there. And we've got, hey, now, we're not perfect, just forgiven. Amen. Um, All right, uh, Brother David. So. We're talking about North African Christianity. So um, before we dive into that, when we talk about North Africa in the Christian context, what kind of geographical, social, political uh, structure are we looking at here? Yes. So now when we use the term Africa, we think of the continent as a whole. Yeah. And Roman Africa was a more limited geographically. So what the Romans called Africa covers part of modern day Libya, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, into Morocco. It's that northern coast of Africa. Now, obviously, um, Egypt is very important for early Christianity. Egypt sure. is part of the, of the, of the, the modern um, continent of Africa. And Ethiopia, another very important center of early Christianity, also on the African continent. But if, if you get a Roman map of the Roman Empire, Africa is that northern section, the major city being Carthage. Yes. Which had a history with Rome. And if you know about ancient history, not a good one. They both were, were vying for control of the western part of the Mediterranean. They fought a series of wars, the Punic Wars, which ultimately led to a victory for Rome. But, uh, but we're talking about that part. If you look at a modern map, it's really western Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and into Morocco. So, which is all Christian, 
Right. Until the seventh century. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Roman Africa then. Uh, all right. So if we're, if we're following the sort of structure and trajectory of your book, mm -hmm. um, so how, so you, do you frame it in terms of like uh, in chronological order? Mm -hmm. Here's a uh, key player. Number one, here's his contributions to the church. Here are some of the challenges during his time mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Is that, is that sort of how it's broken down? Yeah, so there are five main units to the book. Okay. And um, each of the units focuses on a person or a controversy. So I have a chapter on Africa itself where I lay out what is Africa and, and why Africa was important. So just a little footnote, you know, we call that the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean yeah. means in the middle of the earth, in the middle of the land. So the sea is the middle of the land, which means Africa is right along the middle of the land. And if we think of Africa as backwater country in early Christianity, in the Roman Empire, it's, that's just incorrect. It was hmm. Carthage. It's the breadbasket of Rome, and it's central to what's happening in the Roman Empire at this time. So I have an introductory chapter just making sure that we understand that, A, Africa, actually Christianity came to Africa before it came to Europe, it would appear. Right, right. Like Simon of Cyrene, who carries the cross, yep. is a North African. And uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is an yep. African. So this is not a, it's not a colonial import. Af uh, Christianity has been in Africa since the very beginning. So I have a chapter on, on laying that out. Thank you for saying and, that. Um, and then five major units. So the first unit is on Perpetua. Perpetua was an early Christian martyr, one of the earliest Christian female martyrs. Um, so I, the five units are Perpetua, Tertullian, Cyprian, who is the Bishop of Carthage and a martyr, the Donatist Controversy, and then Augustine. Okay. And then I have a final chapter where I offer some kind of parting thoughts. Um, each of the units has three short chapters. And there's a short, there's a chapter on context. So let's say the Perpetua unit, um, the, the, the three chapters. The first chapter is the life and times of the early martyrs. Okay. Answering the question, why would Romans want to kill Christians? What was going on? Yeah. In the historical context. And then I have two chapters where I look at the Perpetua story and how it was read and interpreted one chapter on the positive things, the things that people loved about Perpetua, and then a chapter on the things that some people found challenging about Perpetua. So this, the, the book generally has that flow. Um, so it's introduction, context, and then two substantive chapters on the individual or on the controversy. Fascinating. And each uh, chapter also, I'll just mention each chapter, um, uh, sorry to interrupt you there, Dustin, uh, each chapter also, is I uh, start off with the three main takeaways from the chapter. Okay. And that's because I think when I was growing up, the assumption was you read a book and you figure out what's important. Right. But my experience has been, that's not how most people read anymore. Mm. And so I'm basically telling them up front, here are three main things to look for in this chapter. Oh, that, that's perfect. Hoping that gives them an opportunity. Then, then you know what you're looking for, right? Then the, those, those main points maybe will, will come out a little more clearly. So right. originally just for, for anyone to read, and the publisher certainly was hoping that it could be used for classroom use, and I think it can. But it's also a book that you can just read on your own. Um, the chapters are eight to ten pages, okay. so you can read them. You can take a chapter when you have twenty minutes, Perfect. fifteen minutes. You can do it. Um, I find thirty-five page chapters difficult in books. I agree. Um, yeah. So it, basically, I'm trying to make it accessible. That's the goal. I'm not trying to impress anybody. Mm. Don't try, don't use big words. I try to explain everything. Um, I want, I'm passionate for Christians to understand our history and I want to make it as, as easy as possible for people to be able to engage that. Wow. That's, that's really impressive. You know, you, you would think like how many pages is your book? It is, um, well, let me see here. It comes out to 167 pages. Okay. Yeah. It's 17 chapters and 167 pages. So you can do the math. You see, it's just under 10 pages per chapter. And it's a standard yeah. cut five by nine book. So, well, that's great. You know, I really like what you said there about uh, instead of letting people try to discern and figure out what are the important takeaways, you kind of lay that out so people know what to look for, so they don't get bogged down or distracted, um, right? And they, they can really focus on the takeaways, right? That's really yes. important, uh, especially today with you know how we're so inundated with. I mean, just life in general is just so hectic, right? But the 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 way in which we access information, everything's instant gratification now, now, now. So I guess 
the the more you can streamline a book to make it analogous to like bite sized chunks mm -hmm. uh, at a time that people can go back to and access when they have twenty minutes free or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think the rate of retention and maybe the overall appreciation can be uh, can be increased there. So that was that was very I like that approach a lot. Yeah, I'm just I'm finding that it's. I need to write with the reader in mind, not primarily to try to impress someone. And with academic writing, right, for academic books, academic publishers, it's a different style. And part of what you have to do is, is defend yourself against all the reviewers who will come at you for not being erudite enough and not having enough. And it's a different form. And so part of, at this point in my life, I, I've done enough of that writing that I have some freedom to begin doing writing that that maybe hits more buttons for me. And a very important part of that is how can I help us as Christians understand our past? And part of the, what the, the takeaways from the book in the last chapter is it, if we don't learn from our past, we're going to repeat mistakes. And how can we look at things, look at how they handle situations and maybe get our, get some insights that will help us do a little better, absolutely. not perfectly, but better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Now you mentioned something that struck a chord with me. Um, just a few moments ago, and uh, I was wondering if you could speak on it a little bit and just give me uh, give me your thoughts. All right, so you said uh, Christianity was African before it was ever European. Mm -hmm. um, now, with my with my own spiritual journey, what actually uh, sort of was the key that unlocked everything for me that started me on a you know two decades long journey was a eurocentric history and what i what i began to see is just the the falsity of it mm -hmm. um sort of understanding that the sort of the the root of civilization is, is definitely not european it's not quote unquote white and um you know just sort of then looking at it logically well the the hebrews wouldn't have been caucasian nor would jesus or the apostles or the blessed mother etc and so on um so when I when I first got back into Christianity, um, I myself, even though I'm I'm a white guy, right? Uh, hard to tell, I know, but uh, <laughs> even though I'm a white guy, I uh, struggled with what I saw as the sort of prevalence in uh, in art of European-looking figures who should otherwise be portrayed as more Semitic. Yeah, um, and that that took me a while to get over. Mm -hmm. uh, and and how I kind of and as you get older, you get wiser. You're able to make uh, more nuanced distinctions, and and I think that's just come with age and study and uh, and stuff like that. But what I basically have come to see is that now, anthropologically speaking, it is natural for whatever culture you're in for you to depict your heroes, mm -hmm. divinities in your image. That's just, that's just the natural fact of being human. Mm -hmm. So on one level, the white, the white person or European culture has every right on that basis alone to create light skin images of the divine as an African, as a Chinese, as a Korean, uh, et cetera, would. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's not, that's on one level in and of themselves. Those, those European images are benign. They're neutral. However, I think if we're being objective, we, we have to say that the European imagery historically has been used in ways that other images have not. Like you don't see you don't see Aztecs marching around with uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe and subjugating other nations, right? Mm -hmm. But you you do see that with slave masters and the trend the transatlantic slave trade and that tied in with scientific racism and all that. You know, you go to a, a darker place and you, you show an image of a white Christ and the white Christ looks like the slave master. So, you know, you get the connection, right? And that's ingrained into people's consciousness. So I think uh, the distinction I would make is that um, there wasn't some conspiracy to portray Christ in a certain way to cover up the truth, as it were. Mm -hmm. But I just think that, like I say, on the natural level, it's just a reflection of somebody portraying the divine in their cultural milieu mm -hmm. but on the other hand the european image is more loaded
because of how it's been not used, but misused mm -hmm. throughout history. Mm -hmm. So um, would you would you agree with that assessment or would you say, I mean, there, there's some views that, look, they go to the extreme and they kind of say any production or presentation of a Caucasian or European or light skinned you know, apostle or, or Christ or, or Mary is intrinsically uh, racist. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't see that because mm -hmm. that's, and that's natural. I just think it, it has become that in a certain context because of how it was misused, not for the fact of its sheer existence, which would apply mm -hmm. to that culture as much as to any other. Would you, would you agree with that distinction or, or what, would you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, I see where you're coming from with it. And, and definitely there are other artistic traditions. My, my favorite image of the of the the calling of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus is actually by a Chinese artist mm. named Hei Chu, and who was a, an artist in residence at the Overseas Ministry Study Center, which is right next to Yale Divinity School, where I had a chance to live for a few years with, with my wife. And, and it's this wonderful, colorful, dramatic, exciting image. Um, which I like much better than some of the European images, which are really kind of romanticized, and especially the ones that show Paul as if he's 80 years old. He wouldn't have been. He would have been in his early 30s. Yeah. Um, so there is that. I, I, I hear what you're saying about the, the different artistic traditions, and you do. we do imagine Jesus in our own image, and not just artistically, right? Um, yeah. We tend to read the Gospels, in a way that Jesus agrees with us on whatever the issue happens to be. Mm -hmm, and art right. can, be, can be a representation of that. And, and this is where I, I think as Christians, we need to be aware of, of the cultural resonances of certain images. Yeah. And we could take the cross as another one. Sure. Um, where um, you, I was told many years ago by one of my teachers at, um, at Harvard that in the Middle East, when you want to scare a child, um, in the movies, the bad guys wear crosses, uh, not white hats, black hats. They wear crosses. And I kind of laughed it off. Well, one night, this has been 15 years ago, probably I was in Turkey in a hotel room, nothing to do. Couldn't find soccer on TV. Couldn't understand Turkish. So I'm flipping around. And I found this movie where this guy was breaking into a house and this woman is screaming. She's running around. The guy breaks in the house and lo and behold, on his lapel is a red cross. Oh. Uh. And it was it was shocking to me, but but it gets to the point that certain images have certain cultural resonances that that we need to be very careful about. I think some Europeans who wrote who who, who pictured a white Jesus had never seen anyone who wasn't white. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there's no nefariousness there. No, I don't think. But you're right that 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 could be that no doubt was used in those kinds of ways. Sure, right? sure. Yep. And and there is still, if we think about, um, well, even kind of. There are debates in various parts of the of the Christian world about contemporary social issues, yeah. and people in certain parts of the world see things one way, and another part of the world they see them another way. And in the um, in the Anglican tradition, there's been a debate about some of the sexuality issues, and there's been just explicit racist, explicitly racist statements made by particularly American leaders about Africans. Hmm. And, and talking about them in ways that are incredibly condescending, um, as if there's a kind of cultural superiority because we happen to be from Europe or North America. Yeah. And 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 I'm not doing this to be kind of woke and hip. It's just <laughs> historically true. It's the it's fact. Yeah. It's fact, right? That that we believe in a God who created all people, and 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 we can see in church history that the nations various nations and their part in the in the christian story africa being part of that story and anything we do that in my mind that belittles some cultures or yes. that creates the idea that some modern culture is is the culture that is god's culture i, I find those things dangerous um, yep. i see that I, in the idolatrous yeah, yeah in the region in which i live i i have to be i, I say these things carefully but but there are people I think who really believe that the United States is the new Israel in a very right. concrete way, the new Davidic uh, just, kingdom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just try to remind them that that 
um, it's not bad to pray and let's kneel and pray to God and ask God to heal our land. Sure. Um, that's different from saying God loves Americans more than anyone else. And I'm Absolutely. not sure that those distinctions are always are always forefront in people's minds. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. art can be representation of that, but you're right. Um, it can be misused for sure. Absolutely. And, and the thing that kind of opened my mind a bit was I, I bought into the sort of narrative for a while that any Caucasian representation was um, an effort at a conspiracy, a cover up, mm -hmm. and inherently racist. But then I got to thinking and, and studying, obviously, like archaeology, art history, and I noticed something. I noticed that from the very first, you had like Roman representations of Jesus, for example. Uh, it, some of the earliest are in the catacombs where Jesus is portrayed as a, you know, the ideal philosopher, pagan philosopher, mm -hmm. right? But obviously that image is baptized and it takes on new meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but you have in, <clears throat> the famous icon in St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt is very light skinned. Mm -hmm. um, at that time in the you know sixth or fifth century, was there any consciousness of the transatlantic slave trade? Of course not. But these images existed along olive and more dark skinned ones simultaneously, mm -hmm. and nobody saw them in the way that you know maybe we would have seen them in the 19th century and when they had taken on new meaning and were used for various ends. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I mean the sheer fact that these images had existed. Um, in, from antiquity alongside the quote unquote darker ones shows you that it wasn't it wasn't a racist cover up. And even today, right, if you go to some of the quote unquote most whitest nations on earth, like Poland, for example, where my heritage is from, mm -hmm. the patroness of Poland is the Black Madonna, Our Lady of Czestochowa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, rather than destroying the evidence, the, the black evidence and, you know, destroying images and going on an iconoclast bent, you have the throngs of people in public venerating and parading with images of our, you know, black our lady and black Christ throughout white streets. Mm -hmm. So that just shows you it's, a, and it seems to me also that um, I think because America was founded uh, largely, you know, with the, within the context of racism, it's like whatever religion hits has hit the American shore. It has sort of been, entangled to various degrees depending on the religion or region that you're talking about with racism and it's not the religion that's racist it's the secular sort of ideology and politics that gets kind of intermingled and plays itself out on the ground i think that's more the issue than the religion itself mm -hmm. um, yeah it, religion is a tool it can mm -hmm. be a tool and i a knife is morally neutral you can use it for good things you can use it for evil and religion can be the same way. And you can look at, have people done bad things in the name of religion? Yes. Have some of the greatest advances, some of the greatest humanitarian acts in human history be done in the name of religion? Yes. So, um, yeah, it, people, and people who want to oppress and want to dominate, and they will use every tool at their disposal. And religion is a very powerful one. And yes. that's, that's why I think it's incumbent on 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 me uh, as to be aware to be aware of the fact that the language that I use it's just how it might impact people. Not that mm -hmm. I, I don't need to be ashamed of it, but being aware of the fact that that certain people are going to react certain ways and certain cultures may react to me because of my background. And I just need to be aware of that. And and what can I do when I communicate in this context to try to let people know uh, what I'm trying to communicate and what I'm not trying to communicate. Yeah. And sometimes there can be a kind of cultural uh, sort of deafness about our own language and our own visual representations to kind of get back to your point. But there are, there are lots of cases of this in, in movies and music and where people create Jesus the way they want him to be. And they set the boundaries where they want them to be. Mm. And it's, I want the Jesus who makes me feel good and, but I don't want the Jesus who speaks into my life about maybe about morality. Um, I want the right. Jesus who speaks about morality about this, but I don't want the Jesus who says, you know, what you do with your money is really important. I don't want that Jesus. And yeah. so we can kind of treat Jesus as a sort of a, a smorgasbord. Um, and I find that common and problematic. 
Yeah, I agree. Very insightful. Uh, can we go to a, just a couple questions I have from my sure. friend here, uh, True Form Motivations? I'll, I'll go in order. Um, there's okay. three of them, uh, relatively short. Uh, so can you ask what David knows about Walata Petros, a 17th century African Christian? I think she might be an Ethiopian saint, if I'm not mistaken. Have you heard of her? I have not, no. So uh, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know much about Walata Petros. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Yeah. We'll go to the next one. Um, what do you think about the scholarship of Ephraim Isaac? Are you familiar with Ephraim Isaac? I'm familiar with the name. I haven't read any of the stuff though. So I'm, again, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, that's, yeah, I couldn't give you a good answer to that one. Okay, no problem. And thirdly, yeah. um, what's your perspective on, so as multicultural, quote unquote, as the RCC, the Roman Catholic Church is, why do they seem to keep Eurocentric individuals in the forefront? And you don't see many black popular scholars or apologists. So, you know, again, this goes back to sort of our whole, um, our whole discussion just now. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I could just preface it by saying again, I think it's due to the fact. I don't think there's an agenda here per se, but I think. How do I phrase it the right way? It's it's difficult, right? Choosing your your language, right, mm -hmm. and being cognizant and sensitive, and I, I don't want to be dismissive or uh, downplay anything. I, I see what the brother is saying. Um, I would say that when you're looking at, when you're looking at things from like an, a popular apologetic stand, standpoint, mm -hmm. you mostly get uh, people from like, you know, the North American continent, maybe Europe. Mm -hmm. And I know, I, I just, I just think that again, when we look at something like the Catholic church, right, it is universal. It is multicultural indeed. In fact, statistically speaking, there are, um, the, the quote unquote white people are the minor the minority mm -hmm. uh, statistically mm -hmm. speaking in the church. The okay. church in the global south and in Africa is exploding, mm -hmm. and the church in the West is sadly declining. Um, now I think because sort of the 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 apologetics venture, from my experience anyway, it, it seems to be largely a North American enterprise. I don't know if you if you would uh, that's yeah, just something see what you're saying yeah yeah okay. I, I would I would sort of see that so mm -hmm. um I guess those people who would dominate in that context social media might you know look a certain way like I can I could tell you there are, are black scholars and apologists but they seem to be overshadowed by mm -hmm. their uh ethnically European counterparts at least in this hemisphere but yeah. if we if we were to turn the tables and say let's go visit Catholic scholars in Asia Mm -hmm. in in Africa in the Middle East would they be predominantly European no I just think that because the apologetics venture is situated largely on this continent we sort of get the norm in terms of uh some sort of socio demographical representation if that makes any mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. that's sort of my sort of initial mm -hmm. sort of take on it uh mm -hmm. what do you think about that issue um, one issue I would probably point to is, is institutions as in where institutions are and historically speaking, a lot of the major research and training institutes in world Christianity as a whole have been in Europe and North America. Right. Now that, that very well, that is beginning to change. Mm -hmm. but even in the aftermath of, of, of this book coming out, I've heard from people on the African continent who say, look, I'm really interested in this book, but um, but we don't have access to it. Right. We can't get online access to it. And so part of actually so this book is actually partially funded by a grant from the Center for Early African Christianity. OK. And part of what the goal of the book is, is to get this this book in the hands of people on the African continent right. as they grow up the next generation of leaders. And Perfect. so there is a, there is a technological element to this. Hmm. Yeah. Who that makes can, sense. Who can blast their message out the loudest? Well, people with access to the most money, tech, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and that's generally places in the world where you have good internet access, um, access to the technology you need. And so that has been, I think, part of the process that, that maybe has, Privilege some over some areas over others. We also happen to be living in a period of world history when English is 
kind of the dominant international language. It's not always been that way. 200 years ago, it was probably French. 200 years from now, I don't know what it's going to be. It's probably not going to be English. And yeah. so as these things change, as hopefully, uh, as Central and South America and Asia and Africa, as they begin to establish more and more institutes of theological training, I think we're going to see this change. But the fact is, for many people in other parts of the world, um, it, it's hard to it's hard to replace going to study in Oxford. Yeah, There's just something about it, right? Yeah, there true. is still a kind of historical part, or going to study in Rome, or going to th these places have certain resonances, and and I think that's part of the reason we 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 tend to see things shifted towards certain demographics. I really do think this is going to change over time. Yeah, and and what what I think uh, from a Christian perspective, what we really need is is resources um, flowing into other parts of the world to establish high level training centers in parts of the world that just haven't had access, whose economic systems maybe have not made this possible yet. Yeah, um, growing up more indigenous leaders, indigenous scholars, and empowering them to go out into their own communities, because we know that's how long lasting change is, is made. And as that happens, I think we're we're going to see we're going to see these shifts, but they're slow in coming, because Google's in California. Yeah, true. And and that's this is part of the story. Unfortunately, there are many many uh, thoughtful, uh, brilliant people in other parts of the world that we never hear from because they don't have access to the resources to get their voice out there on an international level. Yeah, and just think if they if they if they or once they have those things. Uh, the contributions that they're able to like, because the way that they view history, mm -hmm. uh, the the you know the way that they've retained and passed on traditions, in many ways, uh, puts us to shame. So just just imagine the contributions substantively that they would bring to the table and be able to broadcast with the right capital mm -hmm. and technology. Mm -hmm. But if that's missing, right? Of course you're not you're not going to see the output right until, until that's there. Right. Um, yeah. So, and in some yeah. cases, if if to, to to speak frankly about it, there are certain issues that the church is dealing with that um, that maybe some European and North American voices have a certain perspective that they that they want to or a certain way they want to go, and and there's just there are cases where they don't want to hear from from the African Christians or the Asian Christians or the South American Christians, because they may be voicing a more traditionally orthodox view on certain things. And, yeah. and that creates conflict. And so um, th there's also just the, the, is there a willingness on my part as a, as a European American, as a white guy to say, you know what, the face of, of world Christianity, as you just said, is not my face anymore. Am I threatened by that? I am not. But I think many Christians are. I would agree with that assessment, sadly, and we shouldn't be. Um, and that's the whole, that's the, you know, original sin, right? Right there. Um, idolatry, uh, ra raising up race or nation or culture um, to an unhealthy extreme. Mm -hmm. um, I forget, there was a, it was a papal encyclical written in German. Uh, I forget the, the pontiff who issued it. It was called Mit Berlinder Sorge. Uh, it was written in German. It was during the Nazi era. And uh, the Holy Father had said, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, whoever uh, whoever divinizes race, uh, ethnicity, you know, you name it, above the gospel is has committed, objectively committed idolatry. And that's what it is. Hmm. Um, so I think we need to, we need to, uh, you know, get back to the, uh, to the notion that, you know, I, I think this bothers me too. You know, when you, when you come from a certain uh, cultural background or cultural context and you say, you know, we have specific needs and problems rooted from a certain history. And then somebody turns around and says, well, all lives matter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, calm down. We're not saying that they don't. But that doesn't negate the fact that certain groups have a certain set of circumstances and needs that these other guys over here might not. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to be sensitive to that as well and not and not brush that aside because the gospel would would um, would spur us on to to listen 
to be uh, compassionate and not not just in word but in deed and truth and accompany them and seek to understand and 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 lift them up right and, and hear their insights and what they have to bring to the table and, and they could teach us many things hmm. um so uh let me uh let me go to another one here uh this is an interesting one again i think it's more ethiopic so my apologies if uh that's not really your your scope but we'll we'll throw it up there okay um, so, so at me, I've read some Ethiopian church forests are perhaps 1500 years old. Does Dr. Eastman see a connection between them and the cosmic symbolism of Solomon's temple? And this is the thing, uh, David, with my podcast, I'm all about temple theology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know how, how, uh, how much you've delved into that, but what, I, what I'm, th I've never heard of Ethiopian forests being modeled on Solomon's temple. I've, I've definitely, I'm definitely fully aware of churches, basilicas being modeled after the temple, but forests, that's new to me. The only thing that comes to my mind with the significance of a forest is the menorah in the temple being a symbol for the tree of life. So mm -hmm. something to do with something to that effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Beyond that, I have absolutely no idea because I've never heard about this forest thing before. Yeah. Um, what about you? Anything along those lines? I haven't, I haven't heard that, but, um, but certainly this, this points to the larger historical connection, of course, with Ethiopia and the Queen of Sheba and, and, and Solomon and then, um, the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ark of the Covenant, perhaps yep. being in Ethiopia. So it definitely points to a lot of those historical connections. Absolutely. But the forest themselves, I haven't, I, I'm not aware of that. I have to say, I'm, Ethiopia is one of those places that I really want to go. Yeah, because it's uh, fascinating, and and I want to go to Lalibela and see those those tremendous churches there. Yeah, um, but I'm not familiar with these forests. I'll actually look it up. I think I see someone else's. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm curious about this now. I'm going to look that up. So yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna look that up. I'm gonna have to message uh, the brother either tonight or tomorrow and ask him where I can look that up because that's that just piqued my interest hmm. uh i love the solomonic temple the melchizedek priesthood and, and all as you could probably imagine right <laughs> so uh yeah uh there is actually i'm in windsor which is about 20 minutes from detroit thereabouts mm -hmm. um there's actually an ethiopian catholic church in toronto uh, mm -hmm. it might be like a major like a kind of like a basilica i'm not sure mm -hmm. if, if it's a basilica or just a regular parish church but there's one in toronto which is about three and a half hours away mm -hmm. so i i would love to because i've watched some ethiopian liturgies online what i do notice is is things like everybody's dressed in white mm -hmm. which reminds me of you know revelation mm -hmm. um everybody uh mm -hmm. robed in white in the blood of the lamb and also the you know the priests and in, in the temple and uh and that whole thing uh mm -hmm. angels going around the holy of holies uh, there there's still my i'm gonna go off on a tangent i better quit um <laughs> And that um, that um, encyclical, um, Mitberlinder Sorge was Pope Pius XII. I should have remembered that. Uh, bad Catholic that I am. Um, all right. So uh, why don't we talk about um, some of the notable figures in your book mm -hmm. and some of their contributions and some of the controversies? So um, who do you who do you bring up first? So Perpetua is the first person I discuss. And in the case of Perpetua, her story was wildly popular in the early church. And we can tell this based upon the number of copies we have of the story. And Perpetua is, she's, she's beloved because she's a model of someone who gives up everything. According to the account, she's a young mother. She's actually nursing her, her baby in prison. And it's, it's the, she's a picture of discipleship to an extreme degree. To, when Jesus said, you give up everything, she literally does. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, she's well-loved and, and beloved as, as an example of this. Uh, in, the, in the story and the passion of, of Perpetua, we have a large section of, of her journal, what appears to be her journal, and which is a female voice from the ancient world in her own voice, which is very important for us as historians. Yeah. But also tells us a lot about the way that that she, uh, even though she wasn't, uh, she wasn't a member of 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 the hierarchy of the church, she was also a very prominent person, and she became very prominent through her fidelity to the point of death. On the other hand, that's also was also part of the tension with Perpetua, 
were um, in the early church at points, there, there were times when the martyrs or those who the would be martyrs or those who had been willing to be martyred but ended up not dying. Yes. When they were seen as kind of an alter, um, alternative authority structure. Mm -hmm. And so Perpetua was also seen as a threat because she is outside. Um, she's not a bishop. Right. She's not a member of the clergy. And so some people had a, had some problems with her story. Um, her story also seems to be tied in, in with the new prophecy movement, the, the Montanist movement, perhaps, um, a movement that had female leadership, which is also a source of tension. So there are a lot of things about her story that also made some people, it seems, uncomfortable. So right. a very interesting person. Um, one of the most popular texts to be read in classes on early Christianity, because it's a rare female voice from antiquity, but also someone whose life and, and witness was was um, honored, but also handled a little with a little bit of uh, uncertainty at points. And and her companion, uh, Felicity. And Felicity, right? yes, who seems to be a slave, a slave, and it's uncertain who she is exactly. Is she is she a slave in the household of Perpetua? We don't know, but also a young mother. And a person who, uh, interestingly, uh, so one of my, my good friends works on this topic and is just read, writing an article about this, a person who over time in later tradition, we're talking about tradition, later tradition is elevated to the, in later accounts, to the role of a noble woman. Because apparently there was some uncertainty, maybe on discomfort with the fact that she was a slave. slave yeah. so the slavery part drops out and she's, in one account, she is Perpetua's sister, like her biological sister, not her spiritual mm -hmm. sister. So um, two very important um, early female figures who model Christian discipleship. And really, the way I, I read in the positive way, and I think the way people took this was, this means anybody can be important in the kingdom of God. Anybody can stand up for their faith. Sure. Even if otherwise you're forgotten, you seem to be at the, low, the, the bottom of society. Anyone and everyone can be a martyr and show the truth of their faith. And that's what stories like this, I think, tell us about the way early Christians saw themselves in the world. I forget the name of the, it might be Laura Swan. Uh, I think she's part of like a, a Benedictine female order, okay. but she wrote, she wrote a book on early church mothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. that's, that's interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, we, we often hear early church fathers, but women were, I mean, you look at the new Testament itself, who were the first witnesses to the resurrection and mm -hmm. their voices were included in, in a story in that ancient context, to give women prominence and voice was was mm -hmm. quite rare, and mm -hmm. some people even say that that fact adds veracity to the resurrection because, you know, in this society it would have been otherwise unheard of or even embarrassing to to feature females in this way. So right. we have right from the pages of the New Testament, we have you know figures like Lydia and Phoebe. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the uh, a little bit later when you have the house churches. Well, a lot of the ho the hosts or hostesses that that mm -hmm. provided Roman houses or you know I don't know materials for the supper were women. Right. Um, you had Macrine, uh, Macri Saint Macrina, who was mm -hmm. the sister of Saint Basil, and she she was really wise and she she taught. And you know you had uh, er early church just like you had the desert monastics uh, who were men. You had those who were women you had abba and abbas right yeah. so there was yeah. a whole a whole movement of women and they were they were definitely and not not to mention you know mary herself mm -hmm. i mean i i thought of this i thought of this meme which i i thought would be funny to make is uh you know the, the guy says the catholic church hates women catholic church declares mary the queen of the universe so it's like <laughs> you know <laughs> that kind of that kind of thing right um, but yeah, that's, that's good stuff. So, um, I, I heard that Tertullian might have even, um, transcribed the, the diary or the story. Do, do you find any truth to that? Well, that's actually something I, that I talk about in the section on Tertullian. So there is prior to the diary prior, prior to the, the first person voice in the passion account, there is a, some kind of editor's introduction mm -hmm. and, some people theorize that perhaps Tertullian wrote that introduction and uh, it, it refers to the new prophecies. And that's the connection possibly to Montanism. Montanus was one of the founders of the group, but they call themselves the new prophecy. And they were very interested in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and a very um, robust doctrine of the Holy Spirit that, that um, 
was more robust than perhaps <clears throat> other parts of Christianity at that time. And so with Perpetua's story, a lot of it, she has these visions. And it's a, it's a very robust kind of pneumatology of the role of the spirit in this whole story. And Tertullian may have been the one who, who penned the theological introduction to the text. That is Interesting. The theory that's out there. And I think there's some, it's a plausible theory because uh, it, it yeah. does appear that Tertullian himself was, I, I would not say converted to Montanism. I don't think that's the way to describe it. I think Tertullian was favorable. And as I kind of argue in the book, I think um, Tertullian's convictions about the Holy Spirit actually led him to be well ahead of his time in embracing and accepting the full divinity of the Spirit, which uh, which other Christians took a little longer to figure out. Now, yeah, to, tied together. the uh, you know, you often hear that Tertullian uh, Tertullian schismed from the church and became a full fledged Montanist heretic, but that's right. not that doesn't seem to be fully accurate. Maybe he had, like you said, he was favorable to mm -hmm. or had sympathies, deep sympathies with, but he, he wasn't, was he like a card carrying member? Well, uh, as far as we can tell, there, there were no card carrying members in the sense that, uh, yeah, the idea of conversion to Montanism, I, I think is a, is a problematic way to think about it. Yeah. Because Tertullian never saw himself as leaving the church. Right. He just saw himself as saying, look, this is part of, of our theology that we're neglecting. I see. And, and even in that time, um, we don't have discussions, for example, about whether Montanists need to be rebaptized. Right. We don't have right. those discussions the way okay. we might about other groups. So yeah, I, I don't true. think that, I, I think schism is probably the better term for that um, kind of a separation. but. As I look at it historically and as I try to re reproduce and, and think about what they had tensions with the new prophecy movement, but I don't find good evidence they ever thought that they weren't Christian. Like outside the church or something. Yes. I, okay. Yeah, there are tensions, though. There's no question. For sure. About it. For sure. And certainly yeah. the Montanists bring a, an alternative authority structure, mm -hmm. and that brings with it its own challenges and its own dangers, potentially. If you're the Bishop of Carthage, and now you have uh, the new prophecy movement arriving on your shores saying listen to the holy spirit well that can that can cause some some ambiguity and people can begin to get confused about who's leading the church right right so, so yeah it definitely could cause some some tension and problems there for sure yeah. all right so moving on from uh perpetua uh who's next on the list so tertullian is next and so i talk about his life and times his background i'll talk a lot about this question of montanism and mainly with Tertullian, what I'm focusing on are the ways in which he develops theological ideas that, particularly about the Trinity, right. that later church councils come around to, but, but later. Mm -hmm. right? So the full divinity of the Spirit, which Tertullian advocates, sure. is, is actually, is not, in the Creed of 325, it's not there. And actually, in the Creed of three uh, of the Creed of Constantinople, which many people recite as the Nicene Creed, which is a Creed of Constantinople, right? It says, "We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Giver of Life, who proceeds from the Father, and then in the Western tradition, and the Son." In the Son, clause, right? It does not state the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. um, one of the Gregory Nazianzus, who was originally the leader of that council, wanted the Creed to say the Holy Spirit is God, right? And there was resistance to this. But Tertullian is saying it uh, almost 200 years earlier. The, the Spirit is fully God, and he explores this. He, he coins the term Trinity, Trinitas right. in Latin, right. and looks into a, a really robust development of the doctrine of the Trinity that other parts of Christianity would come to only later. That's interesting because, you know, you often hear, and when I was Muslim, of course, the common trope was that Constantine... Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, invented the church and invented the Trinity at 325. But uh, he, so Tertullian would be a good witness to show somebody like, hey, look, this predates Nicaea, even though we might not have all the, the precise theological language and concepts in substance. And it's especially uh, significant that he actually uses the term Trinity, mm -hmm. right? And he's the yeah. first one to do so. Yes. Trinitas. Yeah. Very important in that regard. And often kind of pushed to the side. Tertullian said other things um, that people don't like and that are that rub against some of our modern sensibilities, and which has meant that he's maybe often been kind of shuffled off to the side. Yeah. And but part and I'm not neglecting those things, 
But I'm saying even if we disagree with some things he might say about the role of women in the family and the church, yeah. which some people like and some people find very restrictive and even overly restrictive. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to, we're not going to skate around those things. But he also had some other contributions that, that we, we want to keep in mind and, and keep the whole picture in mind with Tertullian. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, everything Tertullian said I think was wonderful. I don't sure. think everything was wonderful. But he made a huge contribution to Christian theology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's that's what we need to focus. And that, uh, that would be one of the takeaways from that chapter, right? Yes, uh, definitely. His, yeah. his contribution to the understanding of the Trinity. Yes. Um, all right, so we've got uh, Tertullian. Mm -hmm. uh, and who, who would come next? And Cyprian is next. Okay. Cyprian, the, the Bishop of Carthage during a persecution and a pandemic. Mm. So uh, very timely. They were often referred to as the plague of Cyprian. It wasn't his fault. It just happened that the plague happened while Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage. The bishop, yeah. Yes. And so there I have a chapter on the third century context of persecution, which was different from the early, from the, the middle of the third century. It's very different from the beginning of the third century. From the time of Perpetua to Cyprian, things have changed a lot. But the, the two main issues there are, are the the lapsed controversy. What do you do with people who have lapsed during persecution? Yes. And then the rebaptism controversy. Do people who were baptized by groups that, that were considered schismatic, do they need to be rebaptized or not? And so I each of the, I have a chapter on each of those, those questions. And the big issue for Cyprian is the unity of the church. Right. What do we do with the unity of the church? And how far can we go in preserving the unity of the church, even in diversity on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge issue. And, and he and, and and several of the bishops in Rome, they had controversies over this. They saw some things differently, and they're trying to negotiate this. But but Cyprian was, was clear that division in the church was the work of Satan. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I've actually <laughs> I've written a short piece that is for a publication. It's sort of waiting for them to do what they're going to do with it about some of the mon modern controversies about things like masks. And you mentioned earlier about meeting spaces. Yeah. And there was a prominent pastor in California who said, this pandemic is the work of Satan. And the way I, I finished the article is, if we let this pandemic and these questions about masks and meeting spaces, if we let them divide us as Christians, then we're doing the work of Satan for him. At least that's what Cyprian would say. Yeah, true. So a lot of this is is dealing with those issues that that he had to figure out. Um, Roman government wants to kill him, and he's under attack within his own church from people who feel like he's being too lax or too strict, right. and constantly trying to to skate a very very difficult middle ground to preserve the unity of the church. Yeah, and his treatise on the unity of the church is uh, is very good reading for anybody out there who wants to read something from uh, St. Cyprian. You can definitely mm -hmm. check that out. You can find that on, uh, for example, I think New Advent. Uh, mm -hmm. He's, he's yeah. got it on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely a good tr uh, treatise to read. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've got Cyprian, and then we would go to St. Augustine, yeah. right? Well, we go to the Donatist controversy first. Oh, right, right. So, yeah, right. so section four is the Donatist controversy which is this schism. It's a division in the church. And a lot of it has to do with, it has to do with, again, the response to persecution. But really the central question in the Donatist controversy is about the purity of the clergy and the bishops. Right. And if, if a bishop has a moral failure, does that invalidate them as a bishop? And it, it comes back to the rebaptism controversy. It comes sure. back to do, um, do baptism in the Eucharist, are, are, are they effective means of grace because they're God ordained or because the person um, who's overseeing them, right? Because it's, of their holiness. Right, right, right. right. And this is the controversy. And and it, it's easy to, to tie this to some of the questions in parts of, of the Christian world now about bishops and about clergy people and about, issues of identity and such that that um, that raise the question you know, when baptism occurs who's baptizing yeah right who who is who is uh, overseeing the means of grace in the Eucharist these are some of the questions they're dealing with and what you ended up in Africa was were two rival factions two rival churches yeah 
different sets of clergy, different bishops, sometimes literally right across the street from each other. And, um, and factionalism that sometimes broke out into violence between the groups and Constantine favored one side, the imperial government favored one side, and at, at one point sent troops to Africa to try to solve this problem. But a, a huge schism in the North African church over these questions. Yeah, and you know, I could just, uh, I, all I could say is thank God that uh, the sacraments are not dependent upon, uh, speaking as a Catholic, of course, uh, upon the holiness or the manifest or hidden failures of the celebrants, because there would be a lot of invalid baptisms, a lot of invalid Eucharist. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank God that that uh, that Donatist uh, thing didn't pan out. And, you know, I, I kind of see an interesting parallel with uh, with the Pharisees, right? Um, the, the emphasis on holiness to such a degree that you end up placing unnecessary burden and strain on the people and excluding so many others mm -hmm. who are perceived as not not good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, so I definitely see a parallel there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and one of the things that the, the Cyprian section and the, the Donatist controversy section together point to is, is a question that I think is still with us in the church. That is, is the church more like an emergency room or is it more like a clean room? Yeah, yeah. So do we imagine the church as being a place, is it a clean room? Is it for the holy people, for the clean people? And we don't want whatever, we don't want those kinds of people in our church, whatever yeah. those kind of people mean, right? right? Or is it a place where the sick and the bleeding yes. and the injured, where they should be welcome? And if we're honest, we still wrestle with this in parts of the church. Sure. And and they wrestled with it then. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, and there's this, there's a tradition there that, that, that favored one or the other. And this, this is a push and pull of the different parts trying to figure this out. And it appears that only the vandal invasions of the sixth century ultimately solved this controversy. At some point, another, uh, an outside force was a greater threat to them than they were to each other. But otherwise, this these these rival uh, ecclesiastical hierarchies seem to have survived for quite a long time. That's interesting. You know, so it's like sometimes it seems like it, you know, and, and similarly with with what God did with the Israelites, right? If you if you guys don't get your act together and don't get your stuff straight in your own house, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to send somebody from the outside <laughs> to get you guys to straighten out, and mm -hmm. kind of as a as a painful reminder, right? As a scourge. Um, but yeah, um, what was I going to ask you? Uh, so yeah, the Donatist controversy. Um, now, how does uh, how does Saint Augustine uh, fit? And, and uh, side note, um, I'm sorry, I keep saying you know I keep prefacing their names with Saint. I hope that's not that's fine. Uh, no, that's fine. I don't. I hope it's okay with you that I, as a scholar, I mean more as a scholar than as a Protestant. I'm just not in the habit of doing that, so I, I right. don't mean to be offensive by not saying it. Um, but no, it doesn't bother me at all. As um, I'm just, I'm not in the habit of doing it myself, and I hope that's yeah. okay. Don't oh, absolutely. You know, okay. I you got your you got your scholarly hat, and I'm I'm just a I'm just a poor dumb layman, so <laughs> that's uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so so where does I okay? So it, like for example, if we pick up Saint Augustine's Confessions, which everybody yeah. should read, mm -hmm. right? He's got this this wayward past. Mm -hmm. um, his mother, St. Monica, is uh, agonizing. She wants him to convert. And, mm -hmm. you know, she goes to St. Cyprian. She's like, you know, my son, he's, he's wild. He's crazy. He's sowing his oats. I want him to come to the faith. So uh, can, you, can you recall sort of this, this, the backstory of like St. Augustine's conversion? How does he enter the church? Yes. And then what contributions does he bring? Yes. So, so that is that's the last session. Thank you for pointing us in that direction. So, so Augustine, um, as you say, he sows his wild oats, and he seems to want. He wants, he, as, as he says in his confessions, at one point he prayed a prayer: "Lord, give me constancy and chastity, but not yet." So, even in the midst of this wild period of his life, he had this nagging feeling that he wasn't quite living the right way. So, actually, he ends up for professional purposes, he ends up in Milan, um, 
where he meets Ambrose. And Augustine wants, wants really wants no part of the church, but Ambrose is a brilliant speaker. Ambrose, who was a government official, suddenly, literally, in the middle of a crowd, made bishop. Um, and Augustine will go and listen to Ambrose speak because he's such a good speaker. But over time, um, the message of Ambrose also begins to, to seep into his heart. So Augustine has this moment that he describes in the Confessions when he's He's, with, he's in the back, the garden of a friend's house, and he's agonizing over this. And he hears a, a sing-songy voice coming over the wall. Take it and read. Take it and read. And he takes this as a sign from God. He opens his copy of Paul's letters to Romans, where Paul says, like, we're not going to live like those who live in the dark. Or we're, gonna, yeah. we're not going to live in drunkenness and sexual looseness, but in holiness. And it's like a, a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt through his heart. Yeah. And that's the moment where his life is, is altered. And he says, I need to leave all that behind and pursue what God has for me, which originally, which he wants to be a monastic life. Right. But he can't get away. Because he's talented. He's trained and people know about him. And so yeah. he gets pulled into more public life in the church, even though that's not really what he desired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then with Augustine, I have the two chapters. One is Augustine, the theologian of the West, where I cover a number of topics and I look at at his doctrine of original sin, his development of the doctrine of original sin. I look at his section on the city of God, which is, I think, really fascinating and timely because Augustine, one of Augustine's main points is, if you are looking to create the city of God on earth, you have misunderstood what the city of God is. Mm -hmm. And just a, a reminder of, of not putting too much of our hope in the governments that are around us, because ultimately those are not the city of God. Yeah, and then a chapter on his controversy with Pelagius mm -hmm. over free will and and sovereignty and where does God fit into our our path to holiness and our ultimate our salvation versus Pelagius, and that's that's a chapter in and of itself. How does how does doctrine how does Augustine's understanding of original sin play into his understanding of God's role and our role or not in salvation? Yeah. Um... Wow, yeah, his his story is just absolutely formidable. I mean, if 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 there's anybody out there who hasn't read his confessions, I highly suggest you get a copy and read it. It is uh, it is very good. All right, so we got uh, Jim. Uh, he has a couple comments. Let's see what he's got here. I, I now I have I don't know why I did this. I have a glass table and a mouse on top of it with no mouse pad. So and I've got cigar ashes everywhere. So it's kind of <laughs> It's kind of hampering me a little bit here. Uh, all right, let's see. So, yeah, St. Monica's feast day is Friday. St. Monica, pray for us. And, and I always then, remind people, Santa Monica, California, which Saint is a Monica. beautiful, beautiful spot, right? And and which gets its name from, you may know the story, from one of the early missionaries who found two, street, two springs there. And so these springs represent the tears of, of Santa Monica that she cried for her son when he was in his wayward days. Wow. And that's why the place has its name, Santa Monica. That's that's deep. No, I did not know that that full story. I, I knew it was Saint Monica, but I didn't know the, the context. Mm -hmm. Um, and then is that is it true that uh her husband, I think his name was Patricius, mm -hmm. that he converted on his deathbed? Yes, it does appear that he converts near the end of his life, which was apparently very confusing to Augustine. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, what dad, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, kind of one of those stories, but it there, that's one of the events in his life that seems to shake him up. Uh, the death of one of his friends, uh, one of his, his kind of his colleagues, his, his, uh, another young person also really shakes him up and gets him thinking about these kind of bigger thoughts. So there's no question, but the influence of his mother is huge. And, and I, I, I echo what you said. Many scholars look at the confessions as the first work of autobiography, of introspective autobiography in the Western tradition. Now, admittedly, when you get to the last chapters, he begins to go into allegory and his understanding of allegorical readings of Genesis and things. And right. that can slow down a little bit if that's not your cup of tea. Right. But uh, the autobiographical part is really fascinating. And with my own story, I resonate with a lot of that, with sure. a period of, of kind of youthful waywardness and trying to figure out. And, and so a lot of it I probably connect with in terms of my own story, but it's a tremendous read. I, I agree with you. Anyone who hasn't read it, I wholeheartedly recommend Augustine's Confessions to you. Yeah, and I, I 
think I saw there was a movie uh, on him. Mm. Um, I, I remember seeing it uh, some years back. It was quite good. Um, it really captured the story well, I thought. And then Jim says, let's see what else. And then St. Augustine's feast day is the following day. Yes, mm. very fitting. And mm. then Jim says, um, I get so annoyed with those songs that say we are building the city of God. Let us build the city of God. I think I know what when he's talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And I understand the instinct of we, we want to try to model our society as much as possible on biblical principles. I understand sure, that. New sure. Haven, Connecticut, uh, it was that was what they took the Ten Commandments as their law. Uh, it's it's So Augustine writes the city of God in the aftermath of the destruction of the city of Rome. Right. Which many Christians thought was impossible. Rome can never be destroyed. Um, Peter and Paul are protecting it. How can this possibly be? And that's part of what Augustine is saying to them is, look, Rome was great, but Rome was never the city of God. And, and so we can't look to earthly things and replace and take earthly things to replace them with heavenly things. Right. Uh, so, okay, here, I'm going to toss up my cigar. It's getting rather low. I don't want to burn my fingers. Okay, uh, Teresa. I read that during Augustine's time, many people would delay their baptism in case they committed mortal sin. I thought that does sound familiar, probably because of the Donatist uh, thing floating around. Well, th there there does seem to be, I will say in general, early Christians, including Tertullian, they seem to have taken sin much more seriously than many of us do in the church today. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and, there's, and there are questions about when you sin, can you be forgiven or not? These are real live discussions in the third century. And so it, it does appear that, that people would delay baptism and just in case. Um, yep. Constantine, right? Right. Constantine did this. So, um, yes, it, it does appear that that was a reality uh, in that time. Yeah. Now, I've heard stories that Constantine was actually an Arian. Is that true? Um. I, so no, it, okay, Constantine probably did not really understand the depths of the debates, right? Right. Um, but I will say Constantine favors the bishops who sign off on the 325 creed, mm -hmm. which was against Arius. Right. His son, however, uh, his son who succeeds him as emperor seems to have been favorable more toward the Arian position. Mm -hmm. And so actually what you have in the fourth century in the aftermath of, of Nicaea, when people are debating now, what does Nicaea actually mean? And that whole, and that's where Athanasius of Alexandria fits into that story. Mm, yeah, you have a succession of bishops, or I'm sorry, of of, of emperors who are pro Nicaea and then pro Arian, and they're kind of going back and forth. Uh, we we talk about Ambrose. Ambrose was in the middle of a, of an argument of a, of a debate of a of a street fight really for control <laughs> of churches in Milan between himself and the local Aryan church. And mm. so this is a very live issue um, in the church for a century plus. But uh, it's it's Constantine's son who really begins to favor more of the Aryan bishops and the Aryan control of churches. Yeah, and not to get too beyond the scope of our um, our timeline here, but uh, the, uh, if, if I understand correctly, the, the intent, and I know some people dispute the manner in which the filioque uh, the filioque clause was inserted into the creed but that's uh, i'm not going to talk about that what i wanted to focus on since we're talking about arianism uh i believe the filioque was inserted precisely to combat a form of Ari uh, a form of arianism if i'm not mistaken or mm -hmm. uh what they what they what they call them what did they call themselves the 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 spirit fighters i forget the greek okay. term the Pseudomachians. Uh, Pseudomachians. The, 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 sorry, the Pneumatomachians. Pneumatomachians. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, so we end with uh, Augustine, and so how do you uh, how do you conclude your book? How do how do you wrap things up? What are the uh, yeah. if you could just give us a few bullet points? Like, what are sure. the main takeaways? Yes. So, in the the conclusion, I have a couple of bullet points, and, and what I tell people is, first of all, remember we are part of the communion of saints, yes. and that is a is a communion that it, that crosses not just geographical lines, it crosses chronological lines, and so when we read about people in history, we should understand that we are part of them and they are part of us. Um, I also caution us against idealizing the early church or demonizing the early church. 
Right. That um, it was never perfect. Mm -hmm. And they were not perfect. So we, there's not an ideal church to get back to. At the same time, they made mistakes. We need to understand that we also make mistakes. Yep. Um, and the final thought that I put out there is, is a reminder that the church is Christ's church. He built it. And he will protect, he'll protect it. it. Yep. And, and the fact that whatever we're going through now, whatever challenges we are facing, I can show you people in church history going through things equally difficult or more difficult. And exactly. whatever failures we might see in our, in our own time, I can show you equal or worse failures in the history of the church. Yes. Christ's church is going to survive because it's Christ's work. He That's will complete right. the work he has begun in us. And so in the midst of a lot of the turmoil and anxiety of our day, I, I invite the reader to take comfort in the fact that Christ is the one holding us. We are not the one holding on to Christ. And, and that, I think, can give us comfort um, in, our, in our days of despair. God has this. Yeah, God I always had it. And I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing I often tell people because, you know, there's a lot of scandal and there has been and there is a lot of scandal in in the catholic communion um but i you know i tell people like look if people during nicaea ephesus uh to nicaea had social media can you just imagine the dumpster fires like mm -hmm. uh, and and again it, you know who taught me this I, um uh, Dr. Papandrea is good friends with Mike Aquilina, um, who who I've, ha I've had on my show as well. And and one of the things uh, some years ago that he taught me is it's it's uh, very easy to understand, but we don't often capture it well um, or or contextualize it well. And it is something that you just said. The I think the biggest mistake that we make, or one of them, is we uh, romanticize or idealize that there was like this golden age of the church. Rather, when we understand, see, because the church is like the extension of Christ's incarnation. And what is what is the second person of the Trinity do? He enters into uh, he enters into flesh. He enters into the mess of our world. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the worst crime, the worst sin imaginable is committed deicide. But out of that muck, out of that mire, out of the mess comes the resurrection. So in the same way, just as the church is uh, incarnational and she goes through all these uh, periods of um, strife and scandal and schism and you name it, expect based on, you know, the fact that our head has entered into the mess, died and suffered mm -hmm. and rose again, where the head has gone and what the head has done, so his body will follow. Mm -hmm. So if we truly trust Christ, because mm -hmm. what does he say? Um, the gates of hell won't prevail. Do we believe this or don't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it comes down to. If Christ, if we believe Christ is who he said he is, that he's God, God cannot lie or fail to keep his promise. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so that's what we need to hold on to. Uh, we've got a question here. Um, uh, two, actually. Uh, so Teresa says, uh, thank you for an interesting episode. Thanks, Teresa, for tuning in and for commenting. What's the title of your book? Um, so it is, I'll hold it up again here for you to see. It. It's um, Early North African Christianity, uh, Turning Points in the Development of the Church is the title. And the publisher is Baker Academic. Okay, wonderful. Um, um, and so is that available now to, it to should actually be available. Yeah, I got my copies today. So I think it's now shipping, but I think it's now, I think it's out, out in the wide world or available to the wide world. So great. Well, we, we picked the perfect day to uh, do this episode then. Yes. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad we didn't wait. Um, uh, let's I see. That. Yeah. Yeah. And Christopher Roberts, does Dr. Mm -hmm. Eastman think there is a genealogical connection between St. Augustine's early Manichaeism and the loss of non-dualistic cosmological outlook in the Latin church? That's a good question. Augustine's Manichaean period sits at the center of a lot of, a lot of the ongoing controversy about his theology. Mm -hmm. Um so I'll put it this way. So um, let's say those who would read Augustine in a more kind of reformed theological perspective, yes, um, uh, who would, particularly within a Protestant tradition, who would 
who would espouse doctrines like predestination would say um, that Augustine understood. Augustine is the one who, who talks about God's sovereignty and about God's sovereignty in his own life. And so Augustine is revealing a spiritual truth, emphasizing a spiritual truth about God's sovereignty against Pelagius, who right. is who are downplaying, right? Those who would not follow a, a model of predestination would say Augustine's model of predestination is influenced by his Manichaean dualism. Mm -hmm. Because Manichaeism was not just dualistic, they were also fatalistic. Fatalistic, the yeah. critics of Augustine would say his doctrine of God's sovereignty, as he understands sovereignty, predestination, is a, is a remnant from his Manichaean past. Interesting. So okay. that's, a, that's part of the controversy about where Manichaeism, and of course Augustine himself writes strongly against this tradition and yeah. condemns it. Um, and the question, I guess, is th that people argue over is, did elements of their thought make sense to him or not? And that's a that's a hotly debated topic. And if you want to mm. watch some fur fly, go into a room of, of Augustinian scholars and say, was he a Manichaean? Was he still a Manichaean? And then just sit back and, and watch and watch the bloodbath. Get your popcorn, um, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's that's yeah. an ongoing controversial question uh, about his legacy, about his theological legacy. Uh, now, you've obviously studied him at, uh, at great length. Would you say that St. Augustine was a monergist? Ooh. Or is there, is, there, is, there, is there more distinction there? I think there's probably more distinction there. Um, hmm. Um, I would say it's. I would say there's def, there's nuance in the answer to that question. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's as with many of these figures. There's 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 nuances there that that would be worth diving into. Um, and I think the same the same is true on sovereignty and other questions like that. So he's yeah. a very complicated person, but always first and foremost in his first and foremost in his mind, an overseer of uh, like a pastor, right? Ah. Um, he writes so many sermons and so many um, of, of his sermons and his, his commentaries are meant to serve the church. He's not writing for academic writing. He's writing to serve the church. Yes, yes. Bishop. Um, so, Jim, wow, these questions are hard. I'm glad the questions were easier. <laughs> well, okay, Jim, since you said that, I'm going to make sure that next time you're on, I'm going to make them extra hard just for that comment. <laughs> Steel sharpens yeah. steel, right? So, so, we'll, we'll so you were mentioning earlier about. Um, I know we're coming, probably coming to the close of our time, but I want to make sure that we think about um, our our situation not being worse than antiquity. There is a story that something we haven't gotten to yet in the modern church, uh, and in, in any of its manifestations. There's a story about a bishop from Alexandria who signs the statement of Chalcedon in 451, and when he yeah. gets home. He's beaten to death in the streets by a mob. We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so again, the early yeah. not have everything figured out. <laughs> so right, right. Yeah. Well, uh, David, uh, my brother in Christ, um, I can't thank you. Well, first of all, it was uh, it was a pleasure meeting you and uh, speaking with you, and uh, the fact that you generously donated your time with a complete stranger, uh, definitely, uh, hits me right in the feels. Um, it was, it was great to meet you. I hope that, uh, God willing, we could do this again. Uh, maybe pick, uh, a, a related topic. Maybe we could talk about maybe the cult of the saints and martyrdom and stuff like okay. that. Um, yeah. or you know what, maybe to, to spice things up a bit, I have yet to do a, I say a round table or panel format where I have more than one guest. Maybe I can get you and Jim on at the same time. <laughs> that might be fun. We'll see if That's he, uh, see what he yeah. thinks about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'll let you get back to uh, your life and I'll get back to mine. <laughs> so I will just close out the show by saying you've been listening to and watching Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was episode 42 with Dr. David Eastman on North African Christianity. Make sure uh, you pick up his book. Uh, can Probably available on Amazon, too, I, I, would, yes. I would imagine. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. And it's uh, it's reasonably uh, priced, like and like uh, Dr. Eastman said, it's very accessible. Uh, it's very easy to read. So don't let the fact that it's published by Baker Academic throw you off. Don't let it scare you away. Uh, dive dive deep in. And whether you're uh, Protestant, Orthodox, Catholic, there's something that we can all benefit from there and draw on a common heritage. So uh, that's very good. Um, so thank you. And uh, God bless you, David, and your family. And I hope that we can stay in touch. And I will probably let you know when the book comes in. And as I start reading it, I'll touch base with you. And uh, Jim said that, yes, he would be open to do that. So uh, thank you, Jim, for watching. Thank you to Teresa, Chris Roberts, um, anyone else who tuned in, um, True Form Motivations. I just want to thank everybody here. Um, let's see if I missed anybody. Hey Now was up at one Hey point. Now, yeah. Hey Now, you're an all-star. Yeah. Uh, going yes. back to Smash Mouth in the 90s. Don't ask me why, why I did that. Um, so yes, thank you everybody. God bless. And we will talk to you again soon. I'm going to end the broadcast in three, two, is my most, well, you know what? I'm just going to use the pad. It might be better. Three, two, one, and good night. God bless.